we had another problem as well. The islands lie in, in Hurricane Alley. We've had a history of devastating storms, for example. The one in 1866, Wayne Neely, who was taken, thankfully, to writing about hurricanes in the Bahamas, says that one was devastating and with uh, 387 people killed and so much infrastructure destroyed, I would say that that was a major disaster. You had, for example, few people talk about it, but there was a 1908 hurricane that had its way on Long Island, for example. Long Island had a surprising, I guess because it's long job, and all through, We've had the hurricanes, 1928, 1929, you had a double whammy, one after the other, and of course, 1929 is legend. And right up to last year, for example. So the thing is, if this happens generation after generation, you know it's going to have some impact on the psyche of the people. And it is my contention that this has created a sense of vulnerability in the Bahamian mind. Mind you, we deal quite well with hurricanes. In fact, I once got a call from um, one of the um, Miami TV channels. The man was actually angry. What's wrong with Bahamians? Right after the storm, people were out in the street laughing and all of this. I asked him, what, what do you expect us to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Anyway, you get a sense of vulnerability and an urgency to get and hold on to what you have. Coupled with this, our early attempts at building an export economy were stymied by international politics and nature. You had, for example, look, the pineapple, we make, we grow excellent pineapples, but the, the United States erected several uh, duties and, and tariffs in several years that eventually put paid to that. I think by the time we reach the 1920s, you just have dribs and drabs when before it was a fairly healthy um, industry. Then, of course, you know all about the sponging. That was nature that decided no more, put paid to that. The, a virus inv invaded the beds and only in our time, you see them coming back and people are once again, for example, on Long Island and some other parts, um, sponging, um, at, at least, and they have some kind of economic experience from it. The generational experience of rapid, unpredictable, and uncontrollable mutability generated a fear of scarcity. Now, I've said this before, and truly, nobody is going to express this or even be aware of it, but I think this is the source, this belief that, you know, the resources are, scared, are scarce and, and easily taken away has had this impact. It's, it's the fear of the rapidity of change, which creates only brief windows of opportunity. The resultant psychology has given the Bahamians a carpe diem, what I call house on fire reaction to our daily dealings. You know what I mean by house on fire reaction. People smell smoke or see some flames and they tend to grab whatever they can and run. In turn, this apprehension has led to an economic behavior that focuses on the cultivation of enterprises and economies of opportunity. I can, I mentioned just a, a few. For example, in the early, early days, you had the wrecking trade, very opportunistic. You had blockade running during the course of the U.S. Civil War. And then, it's uh, America must love us. They decided to go dry in the 1920s and 30s, so with the passing of the National Prohibition Act, or commonly called Volstead Act, of course, 
we right away seized the day and got into the rum running business and were very successful at it. Few people are going to admit it, but a lot of local wealth has come from those sources. And lest we forget to our shame, the Bahamas in the 1980s, beginning in the late 70s, became a major transshipment hub for cocaine smuggling between Colombia and the United States. All such conditions breed a philosophy of all for me baby, of chicanery and subterfuge. So rather than take guidance from the golden rule, the Bahamian golden mean has become let me do it to others before someone does it to me. It's easy to see that issues of trust would be a natural consequence of this way of perceiving the world. As a further outcome, collaboration among Bahamians becomes a challenge as there is insufficient mutual trust, which puts serious limits on honest and open sharing of con concepts, discoveries, for fear of giving colleagues an advantage over oneself or having them dishonestly appropriating material. Also, this, the sort of carpe diem mentality does not support, and this is really key, it, a key obstacle in the path of national development. This notion of the short term of the grab and let's do it quickly, let's get rewarded quickly, does not support research, long-term planning, or logistical expertise. Lately, the media has provided countless examples which can represent disastrous outcomes on the national and individual level. I only have to tell you about honestly. It is unbelievable the saga of BPL. I figure if you are ordering machines and that, uh, to, to rent, and that rental must be horrendously expensive, I would think you would sit down, first of all, to cost out the whole process, locate, uh, for example, a space where you're going to put them, decide on how you're going to transport them, how you're going to install them, the teams you need, whatever augmentation, whatever changes you need to that site and all of this. This is before you even pick up the phone or send an email. I can't, I am fairly intelligent, and I can't even decide whether things are online, offline, whether they were ever online, I can't. But, but this I know, uh, Miss or Mrs. Ingram, who is spokesperson for BPL or BC, whichever one, says they're pouring concrete. Excuse me? <laughs> That's what I mean. I turn to the case of the air conditioning in the critical care block, and I only turn to it. What more could I say? On this head, I will only add that we tend to take refuge in the makeshift and make-believe to hide deficiencies in planning and administration which has had dire consequences for national development. It is imperative, too, to mention island geography again. It tends to breed an insularity that can also prove an obstacle to national development. Ethnicity or otherness, or what the otherness we assign has often become a deciding factor in the hierarchy of acceptance and privilege, and it's often in the negative. For example, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, Bay Street merchants tried their darndest to keep out um, Syrians, for example. A lot of the people from the Middle East started out here in the Bahamas as peddlers on the street and all of this, and apparently very good at it to that it, it, the, somehow the 
Bay Street people found themselves challenged and they were justified if we see what happened afterwards. By the same token, black Bahamians were not receptive to the import of Barbadians who formed the first constabulary or to other West Indians who came, who later boosted the police force, those who came to rebuild the colonial hotel after it burned down, for example. We've also depended heavily on teachers from, from Britain, for example, and certainly from throughout the um, West Indies, Caribbean, Africa, and so on. Haitians in modern, more modern times have been, been subject, they're the other now in Bahamian consciousness, and subject to much discrimination. So we have this, I wouldn't call it a dialogue, but this struggle to have their Bahamian Bahamas-born children given some kind of status. It suits us to do this kind of knee-jerk, uh, you know, a parting of people, sending people off, not accepting and all this. Although somehow, how is it we fail to notice that the, the great empires of today, the United States and all this. You know what the United States and Russia fought over at the end of the Second World War? There was much subterfuge because there were some great German scientists and though they had been the enemy, they fought to get them because they know that this, you, you look for talent to build up your stock. It doesn't deny that you have home-based talent, and neither, if you're sensible, does it reject or deny these people opportunities. Now, we turn to a subject that tends to be taboo, slavery and colonialism. People only want to talk about them if they're being pressed into the service of racism and separatism. You know that is not my outlook in life. Nevertheless, any forward movement in this country must dispassionately examine the legacies of these two pernicious periods of Bahamian life. They have given rise to psychological, social, cultural, political cancers that inevitably gnaw at the very roots of nation building and peace building. The transatlantic slave trade must surely be recorded as the most malignant form of this crime against humanity. It removed so many people, men, women, and children from all that was precious and known to them. It defined them as chattel, denying them freedom of movement, self-determination, and any education or training beyond what was necessary for completing assigned tasks. Slavery strictly defined the limits of their social, cultural, and economic activity with the support of law. The worst product of African slavery in the New World was that it inevitably linked inferiority and personal worth to phenotype, which includes such factors as skin, pigmentation, shape of nose, text, texture of hair, out of slavery was born social and political hierarchies that countervailed the rights of citizenship for scions of Africa. The Bahamas did not attain universal adult suffrage until 1961, as you know, and, and women voted for the first time in 62. Colonialism was the intimate partner of slavery. Its regime created a sacred totem of very little plasticity, you know it was sort of solid, which put British administrators and other colonials at the top of the heap, and they're followed in order, wealthy native whites, and so on down the line of color gradations to blacks at the bottom. This tight hierarchy of privilege led to various forms of discrimination that again curtailed a person's social and political aspirations and participation. The worst of it was the discrimination in access to and types of education, which also dictated a low ceiling for our aspirations. 
The Dundas, believe it or not, was a training center for domestic service and was intended as higher education for the majority. Chattel slavery and colonialism legally breathed their last in 1838 and 1973 respectively, yet the psychology and systems they created continued to inform uneven distribution of wealth and political power. Furthermore, the imposition of inferiority has deformed the way we construct manhood and womanhood, which has yielded dire consequences in this country. To be a man or a woman, one has to produce children. That's just one of the things. In the case of the man, the, the, the more, the merrier, the greater number, the greater attribution of virility. It is a vicious matrix that skews relationships between men and women which demands that the former always be perceived as dominant, whether or not his co contribution to the relationship or uh, indeed to life merits it. Threats to this desire to appear large and in charge, whether they are real or perceived, tend to lead to much of the domestic violence that besets this country and cheats us of potentially valuable contributors to development. I contend also that enslavement and colonialism have gone nowhere, but have taken on new forms to control and deform our potential as a people. In many ways, the African diaspora of the New World is still awaiting true emancipation. That is freedom from the psychological impacts of slavery which dear Bob Marley, whom I love, still listen to his music, taught the world to call mental slavery from which none but ourselves can free our minds. It has frequently been noted that institutionalized forms of targeted race-based oppression have caused dysfunctions to be passed along to subsequent generations to the present impeding growth and development and cultivating dependence and reactive behavior. I think you can see much of that in our society.